Like I've heard you talk about, you know, like the the ebb and flow of life, you know, like dealing with the negatives and the positives. Like, can you expand quickly on how you process that? Because, like, I feel like, you know, once, once you've been once you've been as a fifteen year old boy, you've been shouted at by a thirty two year old sergeant major. <laughs> Nothing much fucking gets in your way, to be honest. Yeah. Um, it's a little life's full of challenges, you know. what I mean, I had, I had, a, I had a, probably had a good start, and that, you know, I had a, I was, like my first job delivered me a fair bit of scar tissue, you might say. So, um. So it was a bit of a thin-skinned bloke as well. So those first couple of months down, but they were tough because that was pretty confronting shit. And so you just have to roll with it, right? You can't. What, what can you? What can you? Yeah, you know, I, I, I get. I get angry at times. Sometimes, some, maybe sometimes irrationally, but you know, um, when you don't get your way or you don't, you know, things don't work out how you want them to. But what's what have you achieved by getting angry? That's sort of nothing, right? Mm. Um, and I think you've always got to take things on net. That's the biggest thing. You know, you've got to just understand. Like, there's, I'm, I'm sure when I'm fishing next week, for example, right, I'll put a hook through my finger. Right, it'll be really painful. I've used it two or three times in a week when I go fishing. Right, now, if that's all I remember about that fishing trip, it's been a bad fishing trip. Right? If I don't remember the six days I spent with my mates. I don't remember all the great fish I caught. I remember the great, just the jokes and all the all the, all the shit we're giving each other. And I just, just remember that one prick in the finger. I almost bled out one year. To be honest, but you know, it was still a that was still a great. But I, I was I had a cold and I was taking like some. Um, some medication that just did my blood out, and I got one little nick on the fan. I'll, I'll, I'll drop the letter of blood in the boat, to be honest. But um, that was still a fun year. So on balance, you look at things on balance. You know, I've, I've been I'm involved in a lot of political campaigns, and I get called all sorts of names and stuff. But for the most part, it's like, oh, okay, they're just idiots, and you, you sort of roll with that. And you know, did, did we achieve our ends? At least did we get our point out? Did, we, did enough people hear what we're saying? Yeah, we did. Okay, let's just. And the sum up, we've absolutely lost on too, right? Where we've just been handed handed our ass every time, and you, you've still got to once in the, in the balance of life, mm. um, then. You know, it's it's great. Once again, like you know, across four years of Shark Tank, we had we had fuck what's turned up to our house. You know, we had rural security issues, for example, right? So, oh, wow. but on balance, it was yeah. you know, we're not going to measure it against 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 those muppets. Welcome to another episode of Unlocked from Within. Today's guest is a tech startup investor, Steve Baxter. He is a proud Australian and proud Queenslander, born in the remote town of Klongtari and raised in Emerald in the state's central highlands. In 94, at the age of 23, Steve put his life savings of $11,000 on the line to launch his first startup, the pioneering internet service provider SENet, from the spare room of his Adelaide home. Servicing more than 35,000 customers, SENet was eventually acquired by Osmail UUNet under the stewardship of its founding director and former Prime Minister, Malcolm Turnbull. From 2015 to 2019, Steve has been a shark on Channels 10's Shark Tank Australia. In 2001, Steve teamed with his schoolmate to launch his second startup, Pipe Networks, a provider of wholesale telecoms infrastructure that was listed on the ASX in 2005. Eight years later, they sold it to the TPG Group for $373 million. Steve spent a year working with Google in California in 2008, leading a project to deliver high-speed telecommunication systems across North America. Steve is now the co-founder and executive chairman of 1013, Australia's leading tech startup investment platform with over 650 investors and crossing 100 million in funds under management. And the founder and lead investor with Beaton Zone Venture Partners, which is dedicated to early stage investments in Australian sovereign lethal defense technology. Today, let's welcome Steve to the show. Hey, Steve, welcome to Unlocked From Within. G'day, Marty. How are you doing? Thank you. Yeah, good, good. It's uh, I think it's been just over a year since we uh, last met uh, in person, and it was, that was over at, uh, had the chance to speak with uh, a few other, the AC participants at the time. Uh, and um, yeah, I found it really valuable, and I think everyone else found your insight and wisdom uh, quite valuable uh, so it's uh, it's good to uh, connect again oh no, I'm glad that's, that's awesome good to see you again Marty yeah awesome awesome well I'd love to just delve straight into it uh, and you know I want to start off uh, you know where it all began for you oh well um, where, how, how far back do you want to go I suppose um, look so it all began for me at least professionally I suppose at my, my first job 
Yeah. Uh, I was born in North Queensland. Uh, grew up in, born in Royal Oaks, Long Curry. Um, grew up in uh, Emerald, um, home of the world's best thermal coal, as I like to say, uh, in Rockhampton. At uh, 15 year old, I, at 15 years old, excuse me, I, I enlisted in the army. Um, signed up on a nine year contract. If you think 15 is bad, wait till you think about a 15 year old signing a nine year contract. Um, but loved it. Um, and the, you know, through that process there, I suppose I, I, got, I got a technical education. Um, I had some great life experiences and you know, I really, really enjoyed being a soldier. Um, enjoyed it more now I'm out, to be honest. It, you know, those stories are almost better, always better when you're out. Um, and then, um, uh, Started a business um, at you know so about nine years in the army, eight years in the army. I started a business while I was still serving. That was a, a dial-up internet service provider uh, out of a, out of a suburban house. That went quite well. Um, sold that. That was in Adelaide. Moved back to Brisbane and uh, co-founded a telecommunications company um, with a chap I went to school with. We we listed that in two thousand and five, and we sold that in two thousand and ten. And I've been an early stage. Uh, um, investor in mostly software businesses, although now a little bit sort of uh, hardware and a bit of military and defence stuff. Um, up to this point, I'm a you know, dad with three kids and um, and a loving wife. I hope I'm a good dad and husband. Awesome, awesome. And you know, just backtracking back into the when you were growing up, and uh, like, did you have any other siblings? Yeah, had um, excuse me, I had uh, t- I had two sisters and I had a brother. He passed away uh, a couple of years ago, unfortunately, but um. Yeah. So um, yeah, it was four of us. Yeah, it was it was a busy household. Wow, wow. And 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 were your parents always there, or did you move there? Um, no, no. The mum and dad were together. My mum passed about ten years ago, or twelve years ago. I want to say it is now. Um, yeah. So um, dad's still with us. Uh, yeah. Kick it on. Um, he's up in Rockhampton still, but you know, that, yeah, we're very good. Dad was in the uh, dad was in the Queensland, in Queensland Rail. Um, very, you know, honest sort of, um, you know, blue collar occupation. Um, it was a, cl- it was a clerk in there. So I suppose it was a white collar occupation inside of QA. I think about it. Yeah. But, you know, we, we were out at Cloncurry because dad went there because he needed that, that next job up in the promotion ladder, I suppose. And, um, backwards and forwards from there, but I had a great childhood to be honest. I mean, we were, we would have been, we, you know, we weren't wealthy by any stretch of the imagination. Um, probably somewhere average at the time i suppose uh so far as you know socioeconomic status is concerned yeah um you know loving parents we were lucky you know born with the lottery right we're, we're, we're two parents and they both loved us that's awesome and like you know through your school your schooling like how did you find school for yourself like was that a struggle oh, look, or I, I, I up until grade 10 i, I quite enjoyed it i, I sort of <laughs> probably, probably puberty hit when i was 14 or 15 and went oh it's stupid would be a good description i suppose just a young young dumb kid um, didn't do so well, so um, I was surprised and glad when the army accepted me. I suppose um, I, I wouldn't have gone back to school, and I, my life would be a lot different. That's for sure. Um, but you know, it's a, it's a good country. You know, I speak a lot at schools actually, and um, I was sometimes worried. I, I asked a, and, and and sort of when I, before I speak, I, I chat with the, the organisers and say, look, you know, I've, my background is basically I, I, I bombed at a school and didn't like it and stuff. So you know, how, how much do you want me to tell them? They always say, I just tell it all unvarnished. Which is great, and I just like the fact that in Australia, you know, your plan A should be to get a good education, right? But but if plan A fails, the plan B can be pretty bloody good. So mm-hmm. you know we have so much to be thankful for in this country, which which is fantastic. Yeah, right. And like, did you have any aspirations, like when you're I don't know, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, of going a different path to the army? No, I just wanted to be a soldier. Yeah, that was it. Mm-hmm. Wow. Well, I had a pretty, I had a pretty unrealistic, romantic expectation of what that meant, to be honest. But um, yeah, yeah. um, well, you know, most of those illusions get shattered pretty fast when you when you you join up, you get off the bus, and someone starts shouting at you. you know, yeah, it, things get real all of a sudden. The the fantasy snapped in half, and so you would have been what sixteen at that that time? Fifteen. Fifteen. Wow, wow. And it was a nine year contract that you signed. Mm-hmm. You had to, your parents had to co sign. Um, yeah. So your parent slash guardian had to go sign, which is you know legally good. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's a shame that scheme's gone away. It was called the Army Apprentice Scheme. Um, so uh, you know, I, I, should we be recruiting fifteen year olds in there? No, you know, sort of seventeens for sure. And you know, should we should is, is the military a good place to conduct trade training? I think it is. I think it's a good place to conduct a lot of training, to be honest. And a lot of I think there's a lot of good skills for society in general that can come through it. I mean, there was some bad stuff as well, and we had. 
you know, it's a martial organisation. It's there ultimately to do one thing, which is to stop the other person, if, you know, violently if need be. So it's a somewhat martial organisation. You can, you, you know, um, you know, so that, that you know, that, that there's some unfortunate things occurred. But I, I never loved it. There were some, there were some really bad things that happened too. Don't get me wrong. It, 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 nothing, nothing's ever perfectly good or perfectly bad, right? Mm. On that, it was uh, on that, it was fantastic. I loved it. Yeah, yeah. What, what you know, and what was your role in the army? Like, what what section were you in? So, um, my job was called technician, electronics, systems, ground. So I was a, as a I was an electronics technician, but my roles were everything except radio, radar, and avionics. So, and there was a lot outside of that, I suppose. Um, so, um, you know, I did uh, God of Weapons, for example. We did, uh, I did uh, um, a man pass, a man portable air defense system called the RBS 70, um, which is being used in Ukraine, actually, to this day, quite an effective weapon system, to be honest. The, the Rapier, which is a radar guided, very, very capital English, although now dated and probably out of, out of service everywhere, um, uh, weapon system was a very, very effective weapon system. Um, Everything also compasses and binoculars. Where our, our people were not that I ever did. We did um, tank fire control systems, um, medical and dental equipment, uh, optics, hydraulics, night vision, cryogenics. So anything that's liquid cooled, a lot of the laser stuff's liquid cooled. So it was all it's sort of where electronics, me, um, sort of where electronics and software meets meets the real world of things that have to move. Mm. That sort of interface. Yeah. Okay. And, and and that time in there, like, did you think you this was it? You're going to be in the army for 30 odd years and this is your career or yet was there like a couple years in you were starting to shift and have a different thinking process? so look you know it was essentially a peacetime army which is is really boring i mean it, and, you know i um uh you know it, it, you're essentially trained for one thing i suppose at, at, at a small level at a, at a personal level and at a subunit and a large unit level um you know you, you're you're there to do what the government asks if things ever get that bad um Fortunately and unfortunately, I suppose. I mean, I think I would, if I had the chance for an overseas deployment, I would have, I would have stayed. Um, but it was, it was somewhat boring. Armies that don't fight wars are exceptionally boring places to be. That, that's nothing on the people who are in there now. And whilst I was in there, were overseas deployments. There were peacekeeping missions. And the lads went off to Somalia and, and did a lot of good work there as well, um, Rwanda and other places. But it were very small jobs. And there was just no, there was just, uh, I, I couldn't see a path into doing anything as exciting as I wanted to do, to be honest. Yeah, right. And, and like, yeah, like growing up and like your interests as a teenager and going into into the army. Like, was it always tech? There was always uh, that interest for tech. Oh, uh, I don't know. Always. Um, better ask better question for my parents. Um, look, I, I um I actually had a chance a couple of years ago to say good day to Dick Smith. The, the one thing I do recall in Rockhampton when I was growing up, the Dick Smith store opened, and Dick Smith used to have this amazing. He had his catalogue. Mm. The front, I think I want to say probably the back third was a catalog actually, you know, of things you could buy and prices. And the rest were literally was how to electronics. It was like a little textbook, to be honest. Mm. But it was well, well, probably, you know, probably well targeted at sort of teenage kids, to be quite blunt. Um, it was mm. fantastic. Um, it was like two bucks at the time or something like that. And, you know, probably the equivalent of like 15 bucks now. I've got no idea, probably 10 bucks now. Um, and I got a chance to just thank Dick when I, I was at a conference and I was speaking about aviation related matters and he was there. And I got a chance to say thanks, and I, you know, because I think that probably had a, a large impact on, on my desire to get electronics. To be honest, yeah, okay, cool, cool. And like in the army, like what were the key takeaways that you know you felt that like shaped you on your, you know, on the journey ahead? Um, don't be a prick. Um, would be would be the best description for it. The army has a saying, "Being Jack." I don't know exactly where it came from, but it's but the, the worst thing you could be called. So you've got to pull your weight. You've got to do your job. You can't shirk responsibility. You've got to be honest. So, um, you know, you've got to be part of a team, I suppose. So, you know, it taught me. I get asked that question a lot about what the Army teaches me, and, and I've taken no technical, no, no, nothing I learned technically I've applied since being out of the Army, to be honest. I haven't had to fix a single radio or or binocular or night vision gear or guided weapon since, funny enough. Um, but, you know, it, it taught Taught me small things. It taught me to teach you a sense of humor. Jesus Christ, you need a sense of humor because they they screw you around like you wouldn't believe. Um, if you haven't got a sense of humor, well, you, you 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 have to grow one otherwise you get out really fast. To be quite blunt, so um, so I taught you to have a sense of proportion. Um, about you know we have a saying, 
Um, cause you're always getting in trouble, you know, know, even if you weren't doing anything wrong, you're getting in trouble. And so I was like, what's the worst thing they can do to take your birthday away? It's sort of, you know, it's sort of, they can rant and rave and wave their arms and let Kermit the Frog all they want, you know? Um, so, um, so it, it rolled with things a little bit. I mean, I, I was, I wasn't, I wasn't the world's best soldier by any stretch of the imagination. I was probably barely average in, in, in a lot of respects. Um, there were some, you know, fantastic men and, and women, you know, mostly men that, we, that, that I served with, um, who, who were far better soldiers than me, um, lessons but if we do like you know um being on time is a big one mm. um uh nothing worse than just young people nowadays crush they're, they're rude mm. um you know literally if you if you were if you, if you were late for something in the army it was just faster and take yourself to the jail rather than turn up get beat up get put in handcuffs and then dragged to the jail so um but you know it's and i don't and this was a little bit of an exaggeration but not not far off it but when you're being relied on you know, and if you're late when I mean, you have to do your ultimate task and if you're late people will die Mm. So um, you know, it's 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 be relied on, I suppose. Speak with honesty, truth. At the same time, have a bit of fun, um, a bit of self deprecation. You know, roll with the punches. Yeah, yeah, interesting, interesting. And then from there and on, like, how old would you have been around twenty three, twenty four when you just dis- you decided to leave? Yeah, uh, well, I think I left at twenty four. Um, I started my first business at twenty three. That was November ninety four. Um. So yeah, and then and I was out the following. I got out four months early, so it was the following September or October or something. I got out. I want to say. Um, so it was yeah. Um, took an eleven thousand dollar home loan deposit and and bought a bunch of computers and modems and plugged it in, and it didn't work for two days. That was scary. Um, and you know, fought bugs and software and taught myself how to program. Um, literally, because uh, you had to. Um, uh, yeah, twenty three. And what was the inspiration behind that? Like, what can you like taking you back to the initial stage that, like, okay, I'm going to go in this direction and start this business? Like, what was the initial uh, inspiration? So I'd, I'd been using computers for a little while, I suppose. I uh, was using bulletin boards back then, but what called BBSs, which are like mm, mm, isolated. It was someone else's computer you could dial up and you could swap files. And that might sound a bit lame to kids nowadays, but that was, that was, that was huge back then. That was how you, that is how you transferred information. So, um, and then uh, I was at a computer user group meeting for, um, so Linux was quite new at that point in time. It was still like patch level 1.5 or what there wasn't, this is probably seven or eight months after Linus first sort of put it, put it in the wild. Um, and so I went to a Linux user group meeting and I saw someone, um, someone had the X Windows system, so actually had the graphical interface going, which is still another big deal at the time. And then I saw a browser, which at that time was called Mosaic, the browser, which turned into Netscape, um, being used. And I, I could just instantly see, because I got compared to dial up some of the BBS and modem and I have all these weird commands and protocols and rules, and you had to be a real, real hacker to do this sort of stuff. This is all of a sudden easy. You could I, I literally could see where the world was going. That was I, I could swim exactly where it was. It was a guy's converted back shed. I could take you to that street in Adelaide this night. I could still drive there. Um and uh and I thought I've just got to get in this. This is this is going to be the biggest. And I thought a whole bunch of things would change. You know, I could see how I could see how a lot of transactions would go online. I could see a lot of shopping would go online for for easy things. You know, mm. I, I never thought we'd buy mattresses and shoes and even clothes online because I always figured that a bit more tactile. You want to sort of go and you know. Um, mm. But I suppose what happened in the meantime was the China manufacturing miracle, um, which has come back to haunt us now, hasn't it? But um, uh, so that cheap Asian manufacturer essentially um, mm. sort of mixed with that uh, ubiquitous way to access, you know. Um, different people selling um, and it's now just gone nuts, right? Um, mm. Everything's online. Money's online, you know, taking it to the nth degree with, with sort of Bitcoin, I suppose. Mm. And like that initial, I get, I guess where I'm going with it to, to, to try to, if anyone's listening out there, like when creating that first business, like your goal was it like, oh, I just want to make $100,000 or $200,000 or was it like, I yeah, no, I, I, I wrote a small business plan, like, and like all business yeah. plans, as soon as I opened the front door, it was wrong. Um, I, I can't recall. I'm, I'm sure my I'm sure my wife can. Um, I, I thought that if I had 300 users, I, I would pretty well be at we'd, we'd be made, so to speak. But I had an unrealistic expectation what we could charge. I looked at what competitors were charging, and I thought, well, if I can only charge a little bit less than that, and you know, they're charging like if they're charging like you know a thousand dollars a year type thing. And if I can get 300 customers, then you know, it's 300000 dollars which seems to make sense. And back then, you know, realize an average wage was twenty eight thousand. A good wage was probably twenty eight, mm. twenty nine thousand dollars to give you a you know a perspective. 
Yeah. So, um, so that'll at least cover my wage and probably double type thing, if you know what I mean. And Emily, my, my, my then fiance, now wife, because she worked in the business too. And But, you know, it's never that easy. There's always expenses you forget and there's always, you know, it's, revenue's always harder and expenses are always easy and you always forget them. So um, it's never that easy. So yeah. I had a low expectation when I started that business. We ended up with, um, with about 60,000 uh, customers. When that was when we when that, by the time we sold the last that business, um, wow, uh, that's not right. He says we had sixty five staff, so sort of staff and thirty five thousand customers. I'm sorry, I got that wrong. Yeah, right. And and like, if you can backtrack to like like with cash flow and sales, when you were looking at, you know, that jump from just being yourself to hiring someone, like, was that a tricky, tricky situation or it was just you had enough cash flow and you just were like, right, we can afford to pay and start hiring people and you started getting momentum after that? Yeah, in the early months, there were a few heart start moments, to be honest. So we had, um, uh, so we used to send out bills to people, for example, right? And most people don't pay their bills. So we learned that pretty fast. So we went from that to asking for money in advance and smaller amounts in advance, which took care of a lot of that problem. But that was... We had two cars in the family. We had to sell mine in order to just to, to, to get enough cash coming in, and that was a bit of a moment. I, I could always see that there was a way through it. Um, and, and, and Emily, you know, my now wife, she showed had an enormous amount of faith in me. That sort of scares me at times how much faith she had, to be honest. Um, so we started a house, um, and by sort of the following ooh, following February, I want to say, we'd um we'd uh, rented a, a shop in Adelaide now there was a, this is the days before credit cards everything like that so people couldn't ring up with the credit card ring all those lines they couldn't dial up with it they couldn't get a line with the credit card so that lift had to come and visit and and a lot of time people come with cash a lot of people didn't have or trust credit cards still because there was still there was still generational memories of, of depression and, and you know in through through people's parents and families and stuff so a lot of people didn't do credit cards mm. so um uh you know money orders and checks were big people bail them into us um so um, look, it was it was somewhat easy. We we had a pretty predictable we had a pretty predictable sort of revenue flow. We, we charge an annual fee, which is only forty bucks, and then essentially a dollar per hour to access it. And minimum minimum buyers being twenty bucks up front, um, which took care of the building problem. And we had some monthly subscriptions later on, but that was how we started. Yeah, right. Um, and that was just great. I mean, our margins were our margins were very solid. I uh, couldn't tell exactly what they were from memory, to be honest. Um, I think by the when we finished, we're doing around about sort of seven hundred k a month, um, so it's about ten mil a year um, yeah. in in rev um, at that point. So, and what did you end up selling that business for? Yeah, it was a, it was about um, you know probably um, so we sold that in two tranches um, uh, in ninety nine and then in two thousand, and the, the combined price there was about five mil, um, which I now know to be an exceptionally low price, um, essentially. So probably. Um, uh, yeah, yeah. If I'd hold that one, I had, well, I had mates who held and probably stayed in front of the sort of for a lot longer, I suppose. Um, and I suppose had businesses probably about twenty times that size. Oh, that can't be right, but probably about ten times that size. Um, and probably only got about three times as much. So you know, the scale, it's interesting, but I, I still think I left a lot of money on the table on that sale, to be honest. Um, but you know, I, I, I like where I am now, so it's really hard to complain. Yeah. Yeah, right. And and like the inspiration, like from on the journey on, like what what was the inspiration in going to that second business? Um, well, I didn't want to get back into business. We sold that, um, moved back to Brisbane from Adelaide. Uh, families were, were in Queensland. Um, um, I started working for a, for a company up here. I'd acquired a lot of technical skills along the way. I was working for Double APT, a large telecommunications, probably the third largest telecommunications company at the time in Australia. Um, didn't really like that at all. I would, you know, um, I wasn't the best employee to be honest. Um, uh, then an old schoolmate contacted me, uh, and he had an idea to do what, um, uh, sort of a wholesale telecoms business. Um, and I've been doing a lot of that in, in SA anyway, and there was a, there was a lot of in, in South Australia and there's a lot of what we did through the peering side of the business, um, was being done by incorporated associations. So groups of competitors who are banding together in order to sort of defeat the boogeyman that was Telstra. And unfortunately, I had a club attitude to it. No, I started a couple of these, to be honest. And then the idea there was, well, let's let's professionalise this and you know actually run it as a service. Um, and it turns out people were willing to pay for that, to be honest, as opposed to relying on a, on a, on a part time charity club. 
Mm. So then from that, we got into fiber optic cable, um, small scale data centers, uh, and then, you know, and then, you know, international submarine cables, even going to the nth degree. Wow. Wow. And like how, like over a time frame, you know, how quickly did you start employing people and staff and, and scaling it? Oh, that business there. So we started that in 2001. Um, uh, we had our first staff in, oh, within six months, I imagine. I would have thought, well, within six months, I would have thought. Um, we got person, person we hired was a technical chap. Um, and we started on the, we started with the, we started building fiber networks and we started getting, um, some contractors in who end up employing, I suppose, ultimately. So within it, you know, but so that's two thousand one. Um by by two thousand and four we'd 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 done a small pre IPO capital raising and in May two thousand and five we'd listed and we when we list we're probably around about sort of fifteen staff. Um so I'm trying to remember now, sorry. Um uh yeah. Yeah, right. Staff. Wow. And like, you know, looking at that first business and then that second business, were there similar themes in the challenges you had to deal with on a day-to-day? Was there a pattern? Yeah, there's one. I mean, it's Telstra. I mean, Telstra was our biggest competitor and in a lot of cases only supplier. I mean, so and that's and that, that, that sort of scenario hasn't been removed from the current um, uh, from, from current telecommunications at the moment because you now have MBN in there as, as, a, as, a, as a problem factor. But you know, Telstra was massive to manage. Yeah. In general, like you know, manage the business with systems quite well. Both businesses, to be honest, we had really good underlying databases and systems and things that control machines or things that, that that schedule people and tasks. So we had sort of a repeatable quality sort of uh, approach to how to do things. You know, um, you know, have people do as least work as possible, not because you don't trust them all, but because just because a machine will do it repeatedly the same way each time, and you'll get a more quality output and you'll have less issues in the long run. Yeah, right. So, um, you know, the the second business pipe network was a difference. We had um, I mean, software had come a long way as well. Um, we had a lot more things to control. So we had to, we had to manage data centers. We had to so we operate a fiber optic network, which is which is sort of tough because it, it's you know, the nice, nice thing about fiber is it's um it is it's it's unpowered, so that you don't provide it's called dark fiber. You don't provide any 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 light over it. the customer does all the, the lighting up of the fiber. Um, that's good because you means you have less equipment. It's also back. You don't know if it doesn't work. So, um, so you know, we had to put a lot of systems in place that if customers started reporting outages, there might be a break. You know, backhoes are evil for networks. Uh, um, rats are pretty bad. Rodents will actually destroy fiber. Um, wow. So, you know, if, if there are hits on the network, it's usually not only one customer that's affected. It's like four or five customers. So mm. we, we put in place like an intersecting tool so you can sort of quickly, if you know, okay, this customer has a circuit that goes across these routes here. Or they're all reporting faults. The common bit's right here. Well, let's send a repair crew onto that street and, oh, look at that. There's a backhoe. Fancy that. Um, let's go talk to the back operator and <laughs> wrap him over the wrap him over the knuckles. <laughs> and how did you navigate the GFC? Yeah, well, it was um, you know, um, not well. Um, that business ultimately very well, I suppose. But you know, just prior to the GFC, about a year prior to that, we had started a, a, a submarine cable project to build a submarine cable between Sydney and Guam, around about two hundred million. I think it was about 160, uh, 160 US, about 200 million Aussie was going to cost us. I, the, I could have these wrong. There's a plus or minus $20 million yeah. either side. I can't exactly remember. We put up, we'd, we'd borrowed some money. Um, we'd also raised some money from shareholders. And then, you know, the GFC, you know, it was quite a strong commercial project. And then the GFC hit and literally, the, and, and we were financing the, the remainder of the build using a large debt package from banks. But it was that was back with customer contracts. So it was a really safe commercial um uh, transaction, I suppose, and then the GFC hit, and literally the bankers just they they fired floors full of build of people, and the, the bankers just disappeared. Mm. So you know, customers got got worried as well, and then you know, so you know, our share price went from you know, we listed at forty cents probably three years before, um, got up to four dollars eighty, and then we fell to a buck eighty during the GFC. Wow, actually, so um, uh, then we we bought Macquarie on board um to help us assess our corporate options, which is, you know, code for, hey, someone come and buy us before we go broke. Yeah. Um, and we would have gone broke, sorry, but we had to, we had to, um, we had, we had to finance another sort of 110 odd million dollars for the cable and, and given the share price and we couldn't raise the equity or we could, but the you know, share price had gone from four bucks, nearly five bucks down to sort of two bucks. Mm. And, and so that was going to be a massive dilution issue. And so there was, there was all sorts of knock on effects, to be honest. 
and and they took us through about a, about a twelve month process and rebuilt the share price for us and we sold for and then we sold for for they rebuilt it to, to five ninety and we got an offer to, to get taken out for six dollars thirty. Wow! So um, you know, it was over about ten or twelve months. It was an incredible period of time. And like on the day to day, like did you just have that belief? You know, the tides are going to turn. I've just got to keep showing up. Um, so look, I in September '08, I left the business as a full time executive, stayed on the yeah. board, and went and worked with Google in California. Um, you know, I was on the board still, and I was I was very much involved at that level. Obviously, the board level is not not an operational mm. level. Um, well, lots of things happened during that period. Like curl your toes, some things yeah. I really can't have recorded, to be honest. Yeah. So, um, yeah, um, I don't think I've lost, I've never lost belief. That's for yeah. sure. Um, we had so much damn value of, of, of you know wrapped up in it, we couldn't afford to lose belief. Yeah, yeah. And and how and so in the end, it was TPG that came to the party. Yep, TPG Telecom. Oh, they came yep. in. Um, all cash offer. Um, took about six months. As they were, they, they take out of listed companies usually six months. It's called it, through a scheme of arrangements through the courts. Um, needing seventy five percent vote from shareholders essentially. Um, which we got. Um, man, it was a good day. Yeah, yeah. it was a lovely day. Awesome, awesome. And you were still in Google through that period, or that's when you came back? No, I'd come back. So um, California wanted to, to capital gains tax me on top of Australia. So um, I um, I up and left. Yeah. Google, so. <laughs> Was that a good good uh, year there, looking at how Google does things? Well, it was, I suppose, you know, in, in, you know, it didn't kill me, so it was good. I mean, I, I was thoroughly professionally bitterly disappointing to be honest i did not professionally enjoy my year at google um i found it a, a extraordinarily hard company to understand the people there were hard to understand um the, the level of entitlement of staff was embarrassing to be honest it was literally like they, they were just overpaid kids um uh you know i i did do struggle but did struggle there a lot to be honest because there was no no there was no you know i i, I and they've done very well, you know. Obviously, they were a massive company. They had this amazing intellectual property, might be in Google Search that everything was based around, and then obviously came advertising, and then you know, then probably the genius YouTube um, acquisition. Um, but uh, no, I found a very bitterly, very very tough year. Yeah, yeah, interesting, interesting. And and so with the sale of like TPG taking over, like what was the buyout in the end? Total buyout? It was three hundred seventy-three million dollars. Yeah. Wow. Wow, and there was a thousand shareholders. Well, there was actually no, there was, I mean, like a whole bunch of like, it was like six dollars thirty. There was like I think about a thousand shareholders um, near the end, um, but then a lot of a lot of these um, hedge funds or some of these funds came in. were literally just offering people like six dollars ten. I mean, it was it was ninety nine point nine percent sure the transaction was going to go ahead for a month before, but these guys were just offering people six dollars ten anyway. They thought well. I thought we'll take we'll take it off. You know, we can take six ten now, six thirty later. Let's just take the six ten now, just in case. And so these guys make like twenty cents yeah. on on six type of thing. Um, so you know, um, I, I don't know exactly how many there were at the end, but we, yeah. there was there was a lot of shareholders at, at some point along came along for that ride, which is great. Yeah, right. And and the journey after that, where did that lead you next? Did you have um, some time off or? Yeah, I, I thought I would have a bit of time off, and I suppose it did not much. Um, uh, you know, the, the time between yeah, me leaving yeah, that six months during that scheme when I was no longer working, um, I pretty well had that off as a holiday anyway. So we we left the US. I just had to get the stamp of the passport that night to to end my US tax residency, essentially. Um, and we had like we went back to Australia for quick holiday, and then came back to the US on a on a on a three month um tourist visa. We did a bit of traveling, packed the house up, um, and then you know moved back home essentially. Um, so and then you know I um, thought well what what I want to do I um you know, I'd learned I learned to fly while I was in the US that was good so I, I bought a I came back and bought a plane just small mm. small single engine aircraft to do some pottering around Australia had a bit of fun flying about um and then started you know um did a couple of small investments in some people and, and some businesses and you know the, the, the first one's never your best I shouldn't say but my second or third one did quite well we got a pretty good exit out of that one um to be honest but um for the most part you know there was a bit of experimenting on exactly what it is you wanted to do and what I want to invest in and end up being, you know, sort of a, a, 
what, what people would think about as a, as a, as a technology venture capitalist. It's sort of maybe at a smaller and sort of more the angel. I hate the term angel, and I'm, I'm not that religious to be honest. I mean, I also think that the term angel makes people think you've got some magical power or some shit, and you don't. So, um, but you know, early stage investor, what I, I like to deem myself. And is, is there a pattern to what you majority like to invest in? Like, is it majority of them service based businesses that might not necessarily be a, like a physical product? Mostly tech, in the in the avenue of tech. I'd say it's tech. Um, that's a bit tough to, you know, that, it's a bit of a throwaway term to be honest. So, um, I like software. I mean, software is software is good. Software is you make a lot of money out of software. You can, you can make software easy. You can change software easy. You can you can market software fast. You can and, and you know it's exceptionally profitable. So, um, so that you know, I'm an investor. My business is to to make money for for essentially for a family. And we get another business where we have 650 investors who sort of potentially follow me into deals. So, um, you know, we're trying to make money for them as well. Mm. So, um, so yeah, software's easy. Hardware's hard. Um, you know, for the most part. You know, we we look for traction. I suppose you know the, the best traction you can have is profit. The second best is revenue. The third best is usage. But if you've mm. got profit, you probably don't need me. So, um, so you know, revenue and and, and usage is, is something that's pretty we're pretty keen to look at. Interesting, interesting. And what and what was the story of you know how Shark Tank all came about? Like, what led you to want to go on that show? Yeah, so I'd um I was doing lobbying in Queensland. I'd uh, set up something here in Brisbane called River City Labs. I saw so there was a gap in the market with respect to um or gap in the ecosystem with respect to services available to early stage entrepreneurs. So I set up a co-working space called River City Labs, and we used it as a bit of a clubhouse. And we ran a bunch of event, a bunch of events, like almost five hundred events over six years. Uh, it was a lot of events. Um. Um. And that I suppose had um, raised my profile in, in the entrepreneurship investing space and in in, in 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 around the traps um, and a PR firm I had on board who who was specifically out there to raise my profile because when I was lobbying government on certain things I just needed people to know who I was and that I, I wasn't just some Johnny Come lately. There's so many people out of you know out of the out of the consulting scene or they were they were, a, yeah, they were an executive in a, in a business which is great trying to do things and literally marketing themselves as the next as the next freaking Sergo Sergo Brun or Mark Zuckerberg. Either they've done this stuff and they just hadn't. And it was just annoying. And, and, and yeah. they were doing it from a big heart for the most part. But they were just and the things they were saying were just wrong. So I wanted to really raise my profile and, and that bought the Shark Tank opportunity. Um which was, you know, very did that for four seasons is a very generous thing to be allowed to do. Um a lot of fun. Met a lot of people how you know um um, really enjoyed it. You know, anyone who says they don't like celebrities never had it. It's fucking great, to be honest. So, I mean, the, on net, it's good. Once again, you know, there was some there were some shitty parts to it, and there was some most 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 were brilliant, to be honest. And like, what would be some of the things like behind the scenes with Shark Tank that the general, you know, the general public don't see in terms of how long it takes to put something together if you do select, you know, a company that you you know you just want to invest in. Yeah, look, well, I say that it, it's only on it's only on B grade TV shows that investments happen in eight minutes, mm. basically, right? So for the most part, it never happens like that. We'll when we tend to have an investment committee meeting every two weeks, or we try to. Um, and you usually see them at between two and five investment committee meetings before you make a decision. So, um, uh, so it just takes a lot of time, and we have in my in my syndicate business, we have eight eight uh, staff, and for the most part, they they prepare and execute deal flow. So, you know, there's a lot of under, you know, getting deals in, having looked at them, trying to understand that are they a fit, why aren't they a fit, then, okay, do we put these forward for, for deeper due diligence because that takes time and that's that's a resource and that, that's that's money essentially. So um, just the amount of work that goes in, I think we did, you know, we've done up to 260 hours of work on one deal. Wow. Um, to get, we have a little time recording system essentially. So, you know, that, that's a lot of time. And, 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 what was the success rate? Like, even if you if one of the Shark Tank, you know, uh, accepted the deal, wanted to do business with a particular business, I used to I used to have these stats. I can't remember them now, to be honest. I used yeah. to get these stats, and I, I honestly can't I can't can't recall them for anything. Look, it wasn't you know, um, for, for if you saw a deal, um, inked on TV or that a hand shook shake on TV, yeah, one and probably one and four of those would go through. Wow, and, and for the most part, you have to understand motivations. Um, it's a big tool, sort of start of season two to understand this. But you know, Channel Ten, for example, that they want good TV, they want ratings, they want to sell advertising. 
Yeah, that's what TV stations do, right? Mm. The entrepreneur, they, they want a good ad for their thing, whatever their thing is, right? Um, and so what are the motivation of the shark? So for me, I actually want a deal flow, if you know what I mean. And, you know, um, uh, you know, I think some of the others wanted to, to, to raise their profile as well, which is fine. So I, I can't really speak to their, their motivations. I've got some ideas, but I, I, won't, I won't air them here. Um, so when you know that, it's okay. So they, they might come out and basically pitch you an absolute fable of a business. There's nothing There's nothing remotely that what they've just said that looks like their business. Um, they've just bullshitted their way through the entire pitch. Great piece of TV, but uninvestable. And that point in time, plus mm. we have an issue, you know, if you're out and out lie, mm. that's that's a... Yeah, that's a prelude to what's get, what you what you'll do in the future. So Red flags. We just don't like lies. Lies. Yeah, are a forward indicator of um of future trouble. And and so like what like obviously seeing however many businesses came through and the founders and and and, and whatnot. Like, was there a theme that you could see? You know, a lot faster, a lot quicker of like that person's going to make it. Yeah, qualities. Not- the qualities. Like, did they show any qualities that that still? Oh, look, you know, um, it's a, it's a you know. It's a, what what you see on TV? Well, eight to fourteen minutes on TV. The, mm. the lot was in a studio was about an hour and twenty. The average would have been fifty minutes, if you know what I mean. So, um, no, the average probably would have been thirty minutes. Now I think about it. Um, so, uh, no, um, I think so. We, we shouldn't say. So our best, the best deal out of Shark Tank was season two was was Will and Dave from Car Next Door. Um, it was great business. Um, so I was, I was had a fair bit of understanding about the delivery method, about the the, the, the shape of their market, their marketplace, and how they how they got their how they got their deals and their business and their revenue and stuff. Um, so that was and they were very capable pitches. They they'd come through the whole startup ecosystem and they, and they knew the buttons to push and what to say. So I suppose that's that's the one that was a standout in that respect. Um, but for the rest, you know, I, I wasn't the best investor for that show in that i i'm not good on what i call hula hoops and yo-yos so i invest in software right um and software is hard on tv because you just tv's a it's it's you need to be able to demonstrate something it needs something physical to show off right and that's not software typically right mm. so it's not it's not a great it's not a great opportunity for, for that format of show and i like the format of the show don't get me wrong but you know it's more Food and beverage goes well. Fast moving consumer goods go well. You know things that you can touch, feel, smell, taste. They go well essentially. But I don't know less than those. So I'm um, yeah. like, what do I do? Um, I did. None of them went very well. So I got that all wrong, didn't I? <laughs> <laughs> and um, you know, after like, what was the biggest things that you took away from being being a shark? Like, uh, you know, reflecting back on that time. Um. So um, I think what I said before is that you have to understand motivations mm. um, or what. Um, and so it's like, you know, you know I said to you know, Channel 10 wanted advertising that, that that the entrepreneur wanted a good ad and me, I want a deal flow. Mm. Um, so, what, you know, okay, so what's some of the motivations for doing this thing? It's like when they, you know, they can pitch in a sales presentation somewhat. It's, it's some, it should be like a gentle lie. It's called puffery. You can, you can puff yourself up, make yourself look bigger than you actually are, right? Um, but you can't say there's two of you and there's only one of you. That's not puffery. That's just lying, right? Mm. So, um, you know, so, and, and when you find a lie, it's always, okay, well, then, okay, not so much the lie, but why the lie? Mm. Uh, that, that's taught me a lot as well. And so you got to look behind and look at the motivation and look at the person. So, um, um, but, you know, no, it was like to summarize what I was saying. It was a very generous thing to do. You know, I think people who put themselves in that situation were very brave because, you know, it could be looking at the great, it could look terrible. Yeah. So, um, and no, and I'm, I'm glad they've got it back on to be truthful. The, like over that four seasons there, like the ones that did make it, the one and four, like were, were they passionate about what they were providing? Like the focus, the motivation was on serving and making a difference. Like providing um, yeah, look, a service, but, so, but they're all sort of passionate, but you know, yeah. is, is, it, is it misplaced passion at the same time? Mm. Is it, is it have to work out. Um, yeah. So, um, I don't. You don't stay in business very long. You're not passionate. Jesus, business is hard. You just mm. you just don't do it. Um, I, 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 yeah, dispassionate. You can be dispassionate, I suppose, and still be. You can come across as dispassionate, but I mean, to, to stick to business, it has to be passionate to actually get through it, right? Yeah. So, um, I think it, it's how you come across externally, and, and and you know how much grit I suppose you, you display by your actions, which is you know sticking with things and, and going through it. So the one in four. 
Well, I'm, I'm only guessing that too, right? Roughly, roughly, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. But you know, for us, the one and four were the ones okay that wanted the deal. Um, we learned in season two, we'd, we'd get them a little, we'd, we'd communicate with them and say, hey, look, that's all well and good if you know if you don't want to deal and, you, and you've lied and this business doesn't look like what you've actually pitched us, let us know. And and we just won't tell Channel 10. We'll tell. The, the problem was that Channel 10 wouldn't, if you did the deal and then it fell over between um, doing the, between the, 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 the filming and the airing, they wouldn't actually air it. Mm. So so we'd say, look, okay, look, we'll just tell Channel 10 that we're in, we're in due diligence. Whereas if in, if in DD the deal was proceeding, then they'd still air it. So we just say, like, we can we can bullshit to channel ten. That's easy. We'll just we'll just tell them we're in constant DD. Just don't 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 drag us down the garden path and make us, you know, expend resources because then we'll hate you and we'll tell everyone how much of a prick you are, basically. Yeah. So um Yeah, so we got we got we got better at, at that, I suppose. Yeah, right, right. And um, you know, after like I guess if someone's thinking a, a business owner or a startup's wanting to go on shark tank or, or look for investment money like what would be the correct steps to yeah, do it I mean, it depends when I mean, make sure it's something that, that matters right like i said you, you'll, you'll do better if you have something you can demonstrate right mm-hmm. software is really hard to to demonstrate for example some software maybe who knows right but you know okay how can i get this across to a tv audience right because what they want is what you want to be able to do is you want to keep your tv ad on you want to hear that pitch your TV out on the air as long as you possibly can. So um, that's how you get the most value. So you know, I've advised a couple of going into this latter season have actually approached me. And I say, like, just do whatever you do to get a deal. All right? Just get You can always renege later on. Yeah. So, just go on and get a deal. Um, you know, make it sensible. Um, don't be... You know, that's much a lie, I suppose. But you know, it, 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 there's ways to there's ways to, to get a deal, accept a deal, and then later on deny, and later on actually renege on it, which which are, which are quite safe and ethical, I suppose. But go on, get that deal, work out work out something about you that's exciting. They can keep on air for as long as they can. Um, you know, prepared to don't go in there with your final evaluation. Know you, know your numbers for Christ's sake. You know, just know your numbers for fuck's mm. sake. Not knowing that it is terrible. Yeah. Um. So, uh, yeah, get a deal, know your numbers. Awesome, awesome. And then from on, from then on, on the journey, like you know, with ten thirteen, like who, who's, who's ten thirteen for? Well, ten thirteen is a highly aligned syndicate investment business. Um, I'm the, now the non-exec chairman of it's um, the operating partners, uh, Stuglin and Arnvo. Uh, I also have Sophie uh, Robertson as well. She's the um, uh, investor relations manager, and we have another chap, Joel Pobar, who's who's. Uh, a partner in the business too. He works out of Anthropic in California. He's a he's a Brisbane boy, a Beanley lad, actually. So um, we have 650 investors in that business um, who we offer a deal to. That, that the team sees well over 100 deals, I think about 140 deals a month. Wow. Um, and over about five years, we've done 50 um, different companies. So it's about 10 a year that, yeah. that, that we actually put through, about one a month, one a working month, let's face it. No one works in Australia, December and January. So... Um, um, so we do about one up one fresh deal a month. Um, so the team will get those deals. They'll 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 do the due diligence. They'll they'll build an investment case. They'll put it for an investment committee. Uh, it's highly aligned because there'll be always one large investor who's the cornerstone check, and typically that's me. But probably nine times out of ten, that's me. Sometimes yeah. there's a there's another investor out there who has more passion, more and more background in that area who, who wants to put a bigger check in. And that's fine. You know that's great. That alignment's awesome, right? Yeah. So there's someone someone knowledgeable with skin in the game. Um, is is what we is what we aim for there. Uh, we have a hundred million dollars under management uh, in that business, so um, we broke that, that broke that goal, we broke that mark just in the last month or so. Um, and yeah, you know, so it's yeah, and we invest in globally, so we probably forty percent of our businesses are Australian, probably forty percent domiciled US and scattered around the rest of the world, Africa through Asia and South America, some others as well, uh, wow. all in that sort of uh, tech space, mostly software. Um, we have one F and B. We have a we have a we have a booze free beer. Um, so that's going quite well actually. Um, I didn't invest in that one actually. Probably I've only done not done, I've only not done two, and then and the both I haven't done doing quite well. Um, the other one I didn't do was actually got Coles and Woolworths as large customers, and I hate Coles and Woolworths as customers. And any anything with Coles and Woolworths as a customer, you run away because um, there'll be there's a high potential for shenanigans there. I think it's probably the safest thing I can say without being sued. Um, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. So is it answer your question enough? Sorry. Yeah, Mark? yeah, yeah. And you know, like, I guess, like, 
normally, like if someone's listening and, and when you're saying software for businesses, is app like creating an app yeah, plus software. the software? Yeah, yeah, but it's app. Yeah. It's like, um, if, yeah. if, if the answer is an app, what the hell was the question? Sorry, I'm, I mean, apps such a throwaway line. Be very careful. Mm. Mm. Um, so, uh, an app can be one way to deliver an outcome. That, that's true. But but if it's your default, but I want to create an app for this, and it's like, well, okay, no. What are you trying to do? Is the best way to do that with an app? Is is a better way to get there? So, um, uh, but yeah, apps. You know, online business. We've had you know, um, video. Um, uh, browser-based video editing tool, ClipChamp. That was one here. What else, what else we've got? Uh, so, well, almost everything software. We've got you know uh, podcasting businesses through to. I can't think of the portfolio at the moment. That's terrible. I should look it up. <laughs> um, um, we have lots. How's that, Marty? Is that yeah, a, yeah. No, that's all. Yeah, yeah, that's great. That's great. I'll and look it up. It's a bit sad. It's, I'm actually I'm actually going fishing tomorrow for a month. For awesome. A month, nice. Excuse me for a week. <laughs> um, and so. Um, my, my brain's actually there. So we, um, yeah, we have like uh, alternate investment platforms, once again, powered by software, uh, advertising powered by software, uh, uh, a conference and uh, uh, function organizing software, sort of AI software, ticketing software, um, believe it or not, cosmetic delivery, but but on a software platform, um, you know, uh, information services, bookkeeping services, software, software, ad services, software, yeah. Web uh, online banks software. There you go. Yeah. Wow. Wow. And you know, with one of obviously one of your little investments is the ASE group. Mm. That's a little bit different to what yeah. you'd normally invest in. Well, that's not ten thirteen. That's that's Steve Baxter basically, and that's that's I haven't invested in ASE or very much. I like the team. I've invested in Taj. Yeah. So, um, but, but Taj has built an awesome team, and you know, it's nothing against any of the team. In fact, you know, I really like the team there. They're, they're, they're all so goddamn happy. Um, <laughs> how they're happy for so many hours. They're not old enough yet, right? <laughs> yeah. I haven't, haven't had the snot knocked through them yet a few times to get a bit <laughs> sad. Um, so, no, but very much um, backed, back in Taj. Yeah. What What are the qualities? What do you What, what do you like about what ASC is doing uh, in the industry? I'm not going to do anything ter- terrifically different. So Taj bought me a vision of what he wanted to do and about uh, how other similar businesses were built over the years. And I've admired Taj a lot. Um, to be honest, he could have been selling nails. I would have invested in him, to be quite blunt. So um, although he's smart enough not to sell nails. Um, so uh, the more recent stuff, I'm not 100% sure what's in the open, but they've got some pretty big plans coming out. To be pretty big announcements coming out, I want to say it too. They've had some yeah. wins of late. Now, I don't know exactly what's public and what's not. So yeah, when this will be released. So um, I might, I'll, I'll keep quiet on those. They have... Um, uh, they're taking a more modern approach to how to deliver that training, all those services and, and through those contracts, I suppose, than, than mm. what was, was there previously. And, and to me... It didn't seem that revolutionary until you realize that the rest of the industry just weren't doing even the basic things. Mm. So they're, they're taking a more modern approach to, to what's been a pretty staid delivery of services. Um, um, yeah. 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 And I said, I, me, it's literally, I just, you know, I, I, I assist Taj on more business fundamental things to me. It's, I don't know his industry. I've got no idea about his industry. Um, but I know how to run, you know, staff. Books, legal, so you know. I know the bottom forty percent of every business is almost the same, and that's where I help Taj is in that bottom forty percent. Wow, wow, yeah. And so, yeah, any business owners out there, like, what what do you think's the key to staying in business? Understand a PL and balance sheet and cash flow statement. If you if you can't do if if you if you're proudly finance illiterate, you will go broke, and mm-hmm. and don't be don't be an absolute dickhead. So. Understand, it's not not hard. We're not, not talking about accounting degree. We're talking about basic, you know, d- d- p and balance sheet and cash flow. Understand that why it matters. Um, that's the basis of everything else. Um, so other, other things are, you know, uh, have a really good understanding of where your revenue comes from, what drives it, um, and where your expenses go all the time as well. So um, the really basic stuff, it's, this is the bottom 40%. Um, uh, you know, understand what it costs to deliver things. Um so many people get that wrong. They were, they, why'd you go break? Well, because basically I was, you know, buying it for $1 and selling it for like 50 cents. You know, it's going to happen every time, isn't it? Mm. So, um, 
it's sometimes hard to work those numbers out. When you know what you're selling it for, it's very hard to understand what you buy it for or what it costs you to, to deliver. But you need to do that. And that all it, it, that comes from just a you know a set of honest books. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. And what you know, looking back on, you know, the businesses you've been in, the businesses you're you invest in and whatnot, like ha, has there been a significant failure that you've had that sort of shaped how you do business? in the future or do things differently? Like, was there something that stood out that you, you know, really? The biggest, the, the ones that I really feel the worst over, we have a lot of businesses that that, that don't make it. And, you know, when we, we have, so we have, you know, we invest between one to 10% of it. If we own 10% of a business, it's a lot. I think the most owner of a business is about 19%. The next one down is like seven to give you some idea, right? So, um, one of ten percent of ASC. I can't remember how much I've got of ASC now. It's either ten or five percent. Anyway, it's around that, right? So, so, um, and I've, I've about ninety-seven or something investments. So you know, it, it, if one goes under, it's it's about one percent of the portfolio, right? So, um, uh, but, but for me, the, the ones that I remember, the one the and, and when that happens, there a lot of things happen. You know, I found there's a lot of value lost and a lot of jobs lost, and there's you know probably relationships that are destroyed at the same time, right? So it's never, never very good. But twice I've had to go through my own businesses doing redundancies, and that that's actually pretty bad. The redundancy basically says that the guy in charge got it wrong, um, uh, like totally wrong, totally planning wrong. So you bought people on, and you went to a certain business line, it didn't work, and so you've got to fix that. So you know through no fault of those people, right? They now have to be let go, and then they're, they're now unemployed. So I have to do that twice, and that's actually, that's really bitter, to be honest. And, and they're the ones that probably scar me the most. Um, it, it, I don't think it, it stops me. I, I, it wouldn't stop me from expanding a business again. Those memories, but at the same time, it's you know it's people you're dealing with. These are real people. These are not not just bits mm. of the bits of Tim you push around a chessboard. This is real people, real lives. You know who matter. They're human beings, and you've got you've got to, got to treat them as such. Yeah. And like I've heard you talk about, you know, like the the ebb and flow of life, you know, like dealing with the negatives and the positives. Like, can you expand quickly on, you know, how, like, I guess how how you process that? Because like I feel like, you know, once, once you've been once you've been as a fifteen year old boy, you've been shouted at by a thirty two year old sergeant major. <laughs> nothing much fucking gets in your way, to be honest. Yeah. Um, and you know, we, you know, we, it's a little life's full of challenges. You know what I mean? I had, had, a, had a probably had a good start, and that, you know, I had a, I was, my, my first job delivered me a fair bit of scar tissue, you might say. So, um, so I was a bit of a thin-skinned bloke as well. So those first couple of months down, but that was tough because that was pretty confronting shit. Um, and, and so you just have to roll with it, right? You can't. What, what can you? What can you? you know, I, I, yeah, I get, I get angry at times. Some, some, maybe sometimes irrationally, but you know. Um, when you don't get your way or you don't, you know, things don't work out how you want them to, but what's what have you achieved by getting angry? That's sort of nothing, right? Mm. Um, so, and I think you've always got to take things on net. That's the biggest thing. You know, you've got to just understand like there's some, something, you know, I'm, I'm sure when I'm fishing next week, for example, right, I'll put a hook through my finger, right? It'll be really painful. I've used it two or three times in a week when I go fishing, right? Now, if that's all I remember about that fishing trip, it's been a bad fishing trip. Right? If I don't remember the six days I spent with my mates, I don't remember all the great fish I caught. I remember the great, just the jokes and all the all the, all the shit we're giving each other. And I just, just remember that one prick in the finger. Um, I almost bled out one year. To be honest, but you know it was still a that was still a great. But I I was I had a cold and I was taking like some um, some medication that just did my blood out. And I got one little nick on the fan. I I'll, I'll, I'll drop the letter of blood in the boat. To be honest, but um, that was still a fun year. So on balance, you look at things on balance. You know, I've, I've been I'm involved in a lot of political campaigns, and I get called all sorts of names and stuff. But for the most part, it's like, well, okay, they're just idiots, and you, you sort of roll with that. And you know, did, did we achieve our ends? At least did we get our point out? Did we, enough people hear what we're saying? Yeah, we did. Okay, that's just. And, and the summer we've absolutely lost on too, right? Where we've just been handed handed our ass every time, and you, you've still got a once in the, in the balance of life. Mm. Um, then you know it's it's great. Once again, like you know, across four years of Shark Tank, we had we had fuck what's turned up to our house. You know, we had rural security issues, for example, right? So, oh, wow. but on balance, it was yeah. you know, we're not going to measure it against 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 those muppets. Yeah, and I guess like, you know, getting close to the end of the show, like you you're you're a father, you're a parent, you got three three daughters. The juggling act between all those things to all those people, like how 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 do you? How do you balance that? If if you could use the word balance, 
Yeah, look, I don't think I'd do it well. I think I'd probably do it poorly, to be honest. I'm, I'm, it's a constant concern of mine, in all truth. I love what I'm doing now. I, I believe that I've... I, I don't know if I'm any good at what I'm doing at the moment. And my latest business is is, is we, we back sovereign Australian defence companies, essentially. So we're, we're in that sort of military technology space. But I really feel like I've found a calling and I'm, I'm, I'm enjoying the hell out of it. I'm not succeeding yet. And there's probably better than a 50% chance I'm going to fail, to be quite blunt. But it's it's a hill worth fighting on, so I'm going to give it a crack. And as a result, though, that you know, my I do feel that my family suffers. I have the best wife, so I mean, we we boyfriend girlfriend when I was in the army, and we got engaged, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And some of her, um, she has the best line. Um, um, she, someone asked her once, said, I, "I travel a lot. You know, I've been in the US five times this year, probably six next year, and I'm away a lot, you know, two to three weeks at a time, type stuff." Uh, they sort of say, oh, did you worry about your husband traveling so much? And she said, I married a soldier who was never supposed to be home. <laughs> so um, she's got, um, that's her outward, that's her outward. I'm, I'm sure inwardly she's like, oh, I wish you were here to look after these kids. Um, I'm, I'm sure there's that. But look, we also haven't done that badly at all. So we have a bit of help around the house. Um, although my wife is just a fantastic mum. She just loves her kids. She, I mean, she, you know, she, she traded in her beautiful, big, angry Mercedes AMG thing for like a Mercedes bus so she could fit more kids in there and be the most valuable school mum around, if you know what I mean. And <laughs> um so uh uh so that you know, I I, I think I could do better. But at the same, I also think there's a lot of value. I, I know there is a lot of value in my girls seeing uh, and one of the parents every day get up and leave for work and come home. Um I think that work ethic is important. Um uh I actually like coming, I, I just enjoy working. And so if I could see me do that. Um, then I, I, I think I'll leave them with a lot just from that. To be honest, awesome. And, and like, what what would you like to, like them to remember you as? Oh, father, good father. Yeah, I suppose. Yeah, you know, we'll remember you as. Um, I hope I'm fun. Um, uh, I hope I. Um, you know, um, my my job is to get them through to being. Adults responsible in society, um, and in essence, if they remember me as a tyrant, if I get them through to that, they're responsible adults. They can and they remember me as a, as a loving father. Great. If, if they think I was the biggest prick, whatever, I, that actually, I'd be disappointed that was the case. But the end products, them, and, and and literally, you know, how much, how much I, how much bar gets taken off me in the process. It's it's just secondary to material. It doesn't matter to be honest. So, awesome. Awesome. And just one last question. If if someone's listening to this, whether, you know, it's one of the, the startups from ASE or a startup around the world, they're thinking of going into business. Do uh, it. Just do it. Just do it. Yeah. No, people yeah. walk up to me in the street now and say, I want to pitch an idea. I said, yeah, you, should, you, you should do it. And they're like, well, I haven't <laughs> told you. So like, I'm probably not your customer. But I, I always, but I also know that if you don't do it, you'll always be wondering. So mm. you should just do it, right? So um, I'm. I feel at times like General Haig from World War One. I'm just like throwing troops over the top of the trenches to get machine gun down. And in, in, but in this case, in business, right? I'm like just got to do it. I mean, it, you know, being in business is great. I love business. I, I love the fact you can start a business. You can set your own future. I, I really enjoy what capitalism brings the world because I think it's just nothing but a force for good. Um, and I, I will encourage everyone with both feet to jump right in. You know, as as one of my favourite founders from Go One Vu says, you know, come on in. The water's warm. It's really really good. Awesome. Awesome, Steve. Well, it's been an honor to have you on the show. Uh, thank you for your value and your wisdom once again. And yeah, love to do it again one time. No worries, Marty. Let me, let me know when you want it. Cheers, Mike. See ya. Yeah. Thanks again for listening or watching another episode of Unlocked From Within. Would you please do us a massive favor and like, subscribe and comment about what you loved about the episode or what insights you got from the episode and who else would you love to have on the show? If you could please share this episode with someone you think it could really help, please do that. If you'd love to learn more about Steve Baxter, please check the show notes for the links to his website and socials in this description. If you'd love to learn more about myself or interested in any high performance business and mindset coaching or future workshops, please reach out to me at martyclay.com. Again, thank you for listening or watching another episode of Unlocked From Within. Thank you.